Good morning. And welcome to worship here at Our Savior's Lutheran Church in Long Beach and those who are joining us online this morning. I invite you to stand as you are able and we'll continue our worship with our confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, creator of darkness and light, word of truth, wind sweeping over the waters. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. God, our rock and refuge, we pour out our hearts before you. We have known you, but have not always loved you. We have wounded one another and sinned against you. We have not always recognized the Holy Spirit dwelling in each of us. Remember your covenant. Renew your creation. Restore us that we might proclaim your good news to all. Amen. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. God has spoken. The time of grace is now. In Jesus, the reign of God has come near. By the authority of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. You are God's beloved. Amen. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Compassionate God, you gather the whole universe into your radiant presence and continually reveal your Son as our Savior. Bring wholeness to all that is broken and speak truth to us in our confusion that all creation will see and know your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The congregation may be seated. I'll invite our young people to come forward for our children's chat. Well, good morning. Have you ever seen the show American Idol? No? No? Wow. I think I'm officially 
old. Well, it's a show, it's a singing competition where people go and they sing and perform and there's judges who then judge who's good singers and who's needs a little bit of work, right? Because we can all make a joyful noise to the Lord. Can I get an amen? amen. For those of us who, yeah. Um, but it was this show, uh, it, I think it's still on, it's still on, right? Somebody else, you know, knows it and is familiar with it. Anyways, this popular show, singing competition, and some people got really, really famous. Like Kelly Clarkson, do you know who that is? Well, somebody knows Kelly Clarkson. Yeah, she sings songs, yeah. You know Dolly Parton better? Who doesn't love St. Dolly Parton? Can I get an amen on that? Right? All right. Yeah, she's a wonderful, wonderful human being. Um, but the, the singing competition, but it's called American Idol. You know what an idol is? Well, that's the thing. It's kind of because people were trying to find the next great big singer. And sometimes when we think about idols or people that we idolize, it's usually somebody who's famous, right? So if we have like an idol, like when I was growing up, you find this hard to believe, but I really liked baseball. Right? And a lot of my idols were baseball players that I wanted to be like. And sometimes I still do, but I digress. But yeah, so these people that we really look up to, that we look, we want to be like, all that other stuff. And so this show is to try to find the next great big act that everyone will look to, will be on the stage. And ah, have you ever gone to a concert and seen somebody on stage? Right? And people are cheering and no? Well, I'm glad that you all are not into worshiping our modern-day idols, right? So that's good. You've learned the lesson. We can all go, right? Um, but over time and way back in history, there were religious traditions and groups that had these little things, uh, idols, or performed kind of like idol worship of these gods that they believed in and these things that they felt had power, right? Right? And in our readings for today, there's, you know, prophets that tell people not to be worshiping these things um, because anything or anyone can become kind of like an idol. Because who are we supposed to worship and pray to and give thanks to? God. Is God confined to one little thing or one place or one building? Even this church, right? Or we sometimes call a church a house of God, but sometimes that could even become an idol, right? It's supposed to point to God, but not be God. And we find God here, right? And so as we think about these readings for today, and we think about idols and kind of idol worship, um, and the different heroes that we might have, we might, we should, you know, look to people who inspire us, kind of like Dolly Parton, right? who wants everybody to be able to read and have books and have education. That's a good thing. So we should inspire to be like people who are doing things of compassion uh, and justice and other things. And the person that we look to first and foremost um, is Jesus, right? Because he's the one who teaches us uh, how to be loving and compassionate and other people who have learned from Jesus and try to live their lives like him. And that's not idol worship. That's worshiping the one who, who teaches us love and compassion. Okay? So let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks for uh, the gift of, of Jesus uh, in and for our world. We ask that our young people will continue to, to look to him uh, as your word of truth and of love and of grace. We ask that you watch over all of our young people to lead them, guide them, inspire them in all that they say and all that they do. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thank you very much. The first reading is from Deuteronomy 18. <coughs> Excuse me. Moses said, 
The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You shall heed such a prophet. This is what you requested of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, If I hear the voice of the Lord my God any more or ever again, see this great fire, I will die. Then the Lord replied to me, They are right in what they have said. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their own people. I will put my words in the mouth of the prophet, who shall speak to them everything that I command. Anyone who does not heed the words of the prophet shall speak in my name. I myself will hold accountable. But any prophet who speaks in the name of other gods or who presumes to speak in my name a word that I have not commanded the prophet to speak, that prophet shall die. Word of God, word of life. Have a good understanding. God praise endures forever. The second lesson is from First Corinthians eight. Now concerning food sacrificed to idols. We know that all of us possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Anyone who claims to know something does not yet have the necessary knowledge, but anyone who loves God is known by him. Hence, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that no idol in the world really exists, and that there is no God but one. Indeed, even though there may be so-called gods in heaven and on earth, as in fact there are many gods and many lords. Yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom all things, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. It is not everyone, however, who is, has this knowledge. 
Since some have become so accustomed to idols until now, they still think of the food they eat as food offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Food will not bring us close to God. We are no worse off as if we did not eat, and no better off if we do. But take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if others see you who possess knowledge eating in the temple of an idol, might they not, since their conscience is weak, be encouraged to the point of eating food sacrificed to idols? So by your knowledge, those weak believers for whom Christ died are destroyed. But when you thus sin against members of your family and wound your, their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food is a cause of their falling, I will never eat meat so that I may not cause one of them to fall. Word of God, word of life. According to Mark, glory to you, O Lord. Jesus and his disciples went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Just then there was in the synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us? Jesus of Nazareth, have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, What is this, a new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once, his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Grace and peace be with you from God, our Creator, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Pray with me, please. May the words of our mouths and the meditations of all of our hearts, may they be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. When I lived in Nashville, otherwise called Nash Vegas, there was a quote that I would often use completely out of context, and it went, quote, where God builds a cathedral, Satan builds a chapel. Now, the quote is actually from one of Martin Luther's table talks, and it goes, quote, For where God built the church, there the devil would also build a chapel. Now, when we hear this quote, we might imagine Luther talking about a kind of like a yin and yang-like situation, like the dichotomy of good and evil inextricably bound in a never-ending struggle to rule the world, each entity fighting to be the ruling authority of this world. And these are diametrically opposing forces or realities living side by side like a church built for God and a chapel for the devil caught in this never-ending struggle over the battle for human souls. Kind of like an exorcist movie, right? And speaking of exorcisms, we have one in our Gospel of Mark for today. So far in Mark's gospel, Jesus has been baptized by John in the Jordan. He's been driven into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. He returned to Galilee to announce his ministry of repentance and proclaiming that God's kingdom is near, and he has just begun to call disciples. And our reading for today marks the beginning of his public ministry at a synagogue in Capernaum. 
And Jesus would also make Capernaum his home and the base for his ministry. And yet we're still only halfway through the first chapter of the Gospel of Mark. See how rapidly this goes? This morning, Mark tells us that Jesus entered and taught in the synagogue when the Sabbath came. He further tells us that those in attendance were astounded by Jesus' teaching as one having authority and not like the scribes. Everywhere Jesus goes throughout Mark's gospel, his authority is questioned and challenged. Those in the synagogue spoke of their astonishment because Jesus wasn't expected to be a teacher. They saw Jesus as part of the Amharats, a poor artisan from Nazareth who had made some friends with fishermen. And they all questioned by what authority Jesus was teaching them about God and God's ways. For he was teaching as one having authority. It was as Jesus was teaching, just then or immediately, his authority was directly challenged by a man with an unclean spirit. And the scripture tells us that the man cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Here the man with the unclean spirit first addresses Jesus as someone down near the bottom of the social mobility ladder. The man with the unclean spirit joined the rest of the synagogue by calling him out as Jesus of Nazareth. And can anything good come from Nazareth, right? The man or the spirit then asks, have you come to destroy us? See, the spirit knew who Jesus really was. The spirit says, I know who you are, holy one of God. Now, this is an entirely different status than the one that everyone assumed Jesus had. But Jesus wasn't quite ready to have his true identity revealed just yet, and for a variety of good reasons. So Jesus said to the spirit, be silent and come out of him. And just then the man started convulsing and he cried out with a loud voice and the spirit came out of him just as Jesus commanded. And now everyone was amazed at his teaching and that he had authority over the unclean spirits who obeyed him. In Mark's gospel, time and space are important to the narrative. The event that we read takes place in the synagogue, which is a sacred space, and on the Sabbath, which is a sacred time. And this story marks Jesus moving from the margins of the ordinary as being a poor craftsman from Nazareth who is not perceived to have any power or authority on his own into the sacred space of the synagogue where he assumes the role of religious teacher or rabbi, and even the Holy One of God. It is here in his first public ministry appearance that Jesus challenges the social role and power of the scribal aristocracy that would normally have authority in and over the synagogue, as well as the people coming and going. Now, we don't know if the scribes were present at the synagogue on that Sabbath or not, but they do not receive a mention. They do receive a mention in relationship to Jesus' teaching with authority and not like the scribes. But who are the scribes anyway? You see, scribes in first century Roman Palestine were not just copyists, secretaries, or notaries, although they performed those duties of writing certificates of marriage, divorce, property stuff, etc. But they were also the spiritual descendants of Ezra the scribe, and as doctors of the law, They were highly educated, typically in Jerusalem. They were the authorized biblical scholars of their time with responsibilities for copying, reading, interpreting the scriptures for those who were dispersed around the Roman Empire. They were the authority when it came to interpreting the law, and they were part of the religious authorities along with the Pharisees and Sadducees based in Jerusalem and the temple. This event in the synagogue becomes a precursor to the budding conflict between Jesus over and against the scribes and the Pharisees. The scribes and the Pharisees, along with the Herodians, will challenge Jesus over his power and authority and influence in religious and civic matters. 
Our reading for today is the public beginning of the popular movement that Jesus is building. And Jesus is building a movement and a community from among everyday people who, like himself, were often viewed as the castoffs and looked down upon by the more learned scribes and Pharisees. These people are often referred to as the Amharits, or people of the land. They are the uneducated, rustic population of the first century Palestine. They are the masses of people who sought out Jesus for healing, his teachings, and maybe an exorcism or two. Now, while the scribes and Pharisees might have been well-respected by most because of their dedication to the law, they were not about to allow a nobody to come in and usher in revolutionary changes when it comes to the interpretation of the law as well as control over who is in, who is out, who is clean, who is unclean. Jesus' proclamation that the kingdom of God was coming near, that people should repent, turn from their ways, and follow him and his movement for justice and freedom, flew in the face of the scribes and the Pharisees. You see, the scribes and the Pharisees at this time were more focused on temple sacrifice and teaching people to follow every letter of the law as they themselves properly understood and taught it. And they were also more interested in going along and getting along with the imperial system and some of the power and authority that they were able to enjoy for themselves. But for the people who were suffering and hurting under Roman and Herodian occupation, the temple sacrifices were not enough to bring about the change that they longed for. Purity rituals and rites weren't going to end their suffering nor bring forth the kingdom of justice and righteousness that Jesus was teaching about. The scribes and the Pharisees were protectors of the status quo, and Jesus was about turning over tables and disrupting the status quo. You see, Jesus was about ushering in God's beloved community by freeing people from systems of oppression so that they could live in freedom to love and to care for one another. So when Martin Luther spoke, saying, for when God built the church, the devil builds a chapel, I probably should have given a bit more context. You see, this quote from one of Luther's table talks was one where he was talking about the old traditions of Greeks, Romans, and even First and Second Temple Judaism that had a tendency to put God in a temple or to put God in a box, or in some cases, to put God in a box and in a temple. It was a warning about making the church an idol out of an institution or a building. The full quote of Luther reads, quote, The Greeks and heathens built temples for their idols in certain places, as at Ephesus for Diana, at Delphos for Apollo, etc. For where God built the church, there the devil would also build the chapel. They imitated the Jews also in this, namely that as the most holiest was dark and had no light, even so, after the same manner did they make their places dark where the devil made answer, as at Delphos and elsewhere. In such, short is the devil, always God's ape. But continued Luther, whereas the most holiest must be dark, the same did signify that the kingdom of Christ no way was to be taken hold of and fastened, but only by the word and by faith. We can easily fall into the same idolatry as the scribes and the Pharisees of the synagogue when we forget that the church as a building or institution is not the end-all and be-all. The church is hopefully a place where everyday people can come and experience God's word, God's grace, and God's love. And when we become more interested in defending the status quo or in worshiping or celebrating what we built in the past tense, rather than being about following the way of Jesus by doing the work of building community in the present tense, we run the risk of being consumed by unclean spirits that we may need to cast out. You see, the word of God calls us to build up a beloved community that may gather in a certain sacred place at a sacred time for specific functions, including worship and prayer. 
but we need to remember that Jesus didn't restrain his movement to the synagogue, just as we shouldn't restrict sharing God's word to only in the church or in the chapel. Jesus' public ministry began in a synagogue as he was casting out bad spirits within a place that was more concerned about their own authority and power. And our gospel gospel reading reminds us that Jesus challenges the status quo of our religious institutions when we place limits and restrict our freedom to love and care for one another, which is what God truly demands of us. Jesus has come to free us from the unclean spirits that keep us from going out into the world to proclaim the good news of God's grace and God's inclusive love. And Jesus invites us to build up the beloved community of God through our works of love and of service. So my siblings in Christ, may God's word cast out any unclean spirits that are in our hearts and our minds so that we might be renewed in our commitment to follow the way of Jesus. And may we work together to build a sacred space where God's inclusive love and grace inspire us to go out and share the good news with others. And may God's spirit dwell within each and every one of us so that wherever we go, we may embody God's church and be Christ's body in and for the sake of our world. Amen.
celebrate Christ embodied in human form, we pray for God's blessing on the church, the world, and all of creation. Loving God, we pray that your example of teaching with confidence and authority builds up your church in love. May all church leaders and teachers honor your instruction and model your inclusive ways. God of grace. Renewing God, we pray for all creation, that waterways flow clean and clear, natural spaces are protected, and our planet is healed. Let us commit to thoughtful use of the earth. God of grace. God of justice, we pray for those in government and community leadership, that they lead with honor and mindfulness. May they remember their covenants and be upright in their ways. God of grace. God of compassion, we pray for all in need, especially those who have known rejection, any who struggle with long-term illness or chronic pain, those without access to safe housing or health care, and any who suffer, especially B.J. Wells, Felicia Singleton, Layla Bartz, and Albert Martinez. God of grace. God that still speaks, we pray for our congregation, for its artists and musicians, for its educators and caregivers, that all gifts are used to care for those in need and to live out your example of compassion, gospel witness, and love. God of grace. Eternal God, we remember all who have been teachers, mentors, and companions in the church and in our lives, especially Thomas Aquinas, who we commemorate today. We trust that all who have died rest in your loving care. God of grace. Knowing the Holy Spirit intercedes for us, we offer these prayers and the silent prayers of our hearts in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. I invite you to share a sign of Christ's peace with your neighbor. Peace with you.
Blessed are you, O Holy One, for all good things come from you. In bread and cup you open heaven to us. Meet us at this table that we receive what we seek and follow your Son, Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy, mighty, and merciful Lord, heaven and earth are full of your glory. In great love you send to us Jesus, your Son, who reached out to heal the sick and suffering, who preached good news to the poor, and who on the cross opened his arms to all. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, and he gave thanks, and he broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup and he gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his death, resurrection, and ascension, we await his coming in glory. Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, O Lord and unite the wills of all who share this heavenly food, the body and blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. At Jesus' table, heaven and earth are joined as one. Come and see.
Please stand. The body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen you and keep you in God's grace. Amen. Giver of every gift, Christ's body is our food, and we are Christ's body. Raise us up to life by your power for the benefit of all and to your glory now and forever. Congregation may be seated for our announcements. Following the service, we're going to take a short break as we get set for our annual meeting. Yay! So we'll have our annual meeting uh, following the service, uh, and we do have packets uh, of the annual report for those who uh, haven't gotten those yet. Someone would like to get those, we'll have those available. Uh, we will have some coffee and some other stuff available here as well. So be sure to, to caffeinate yourself if you need it, um, and we'll, we'll begin that uh, shortly. Um, Bible study Wednesdays, 11 o'clock. Uh, we're going to start to go in the fireside room. Uh, so we're going to move on over there, mix it up a little bit as we get ready for our uh, Advent, or not Advent, whoa. I'm going to... I want to get ready for Christmas again. Can you blame me? Um, as we get ready for Lent and Ash Wednesday, which is uh, February 14th, that's also some other holiday, I think. Um, it's reminders on my calendar. Uh, Valentine's Day also coincides with uh, Ash Wednesday, uh, but we'll be doing uh, midweek devotions um, that first Wednesday in Lent. Uh, not Ash Wednesday, the Wednesday after, but... Uh, a midday devotion at noon with a soup lunch uh, in the uh, fellowship hall, fireside room, uh, depending upon what's available that day. So you can join us for that. Uh, and then we'll do an online Zoom midweek devotion around 7 o'clock uh, for those who would like to participate in that as well. Uh, and we'll be using uh, the ELCA or Lutheran World Hunger uh, devotions this year. And I'll send a, a copy and have that posted so people can download those uh, and participate either online or in person. So mark your calendars for that. <clears throat> we do have a, a special uh, guest who will be with us next week. Um, I just arranged it uh, earlier this week, uh, but Reverend Jennifer Gutierrez, who is the Director of Clergy and Laity United for Economic Justice, uh, she'll be... Uh, I'll be sharing my pulpit with her. Uh, she's also a United Methodist pastor as well. Um, but with things coming up uh, in uh, March, uh, with the election, I think there's a, a living wage uh, thing on the ballot uh, as well, um, and some other things. So we thought we'd get people thinking about what's happening in our, our city, in our community, uh, and ways that we can be engaged uh, civically uh, as well uh, on issues. No endorsement of candidates, but to talk about the issues that, you know, we think Jesus would, would care about as well. So she'll be uh, here to preach uh, and to share some uh, uh, voices of some of our, our uh, fellow workers uh, in the Long Beach area and some of their struggles. 
um, with trying to, to live and work, uh, not just in the city, but uh, throughout the state uh, and the country. So, uh, and I think those are the announcements that I have for now. All the other ones you can see printed in the bulletin, okay? Anything else that I missed? Okay. With that, please stand as you are able and receive the blessing. God who names you, Christ who claims you, and the Holy Spirit who dwells in you, bless you and remain with you always. Amen. God's beloved.